There we are. Hey, welcome to the He Is Greater podcast. I am your host, Rich Tidwell, and tonight I have a lovely and wonderful guest with me, Mary uh, Bro. It's Bruff. Oh, Bruff. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Mar- oh yeah, well, Bro. Bruff. <laughs> Bruff with a B. Mary Bruff is um, uh, joining me this evening, and she is a good friend of mine, and also a uh, she's training to be a midwife uh, here in Daytona Beach. She's currently training, uh, and uh, it's very exciting. So I'm going to give her a chance to tell you a little bit about herself. Uh, take it away, Mary. What are you doing, and uh, and why is this topic that we're talking about so important to you? Um. Well, right now I'm in Daytona because I'm training to be a midwife. It's a wonderful experience so far. Abortion is out at agape. Hey, agape. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Um, Abortion is very close to my heart, I guess, because I've been doing anti-abortion things since I was about 15. You know, but when I came to the realization that abortion is the taking of a human life, and right. God values all human beings, right? Um, including both the mother and the baby. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we're going to get into it a little bit more. So. Yeah, no. Um, tonight, uh, we are asking the question, what is the Christian response to abortion? Um, you guys might know that I made a video on this topic uh, a couple of years ago now, um, and we asked, is abortion murder? And so this is kind of a continuation of that discussion um, because uh, I believe three more million children have been aborted since I made that video. And so with numbers like that, um, we really have to ask this question. We really have to take it seriously. In fact, to kind of lend some gravity to the situation, what we're really talking about, I want to show you um, this this abortion clock that actually shows how frequently this is taking place and why it is something that we do not only need to discuss, but we need to stop it from happening. Um, And let me show you. Browser. There it is. Uh, I have have links down in the description that you guys can check out uh, pretty much of everything that we're talking about this evening, including the scriptures. You can click those links follow along with the scriptures. You can follow along with links like this one. Uh, but this is uh, an abortion clock, um, and uh, it shows a number of different statistics on abortion, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Um, and as you can see, there's the first clock there in the top left, um, says that in the United States, just today, there's been over 2,000 abortions. So since you woke up this morning, 2,000 children um, have ceased to exist, at least in body. Um, Since Roe v. Wade in 1973, there has been 60,137,967 abortions. 60 million abortions since that took place, since that ruling happened. Um, And like I said, there's been, uh, I think, three million since I made my last video on this topic. Each year, there are a ton of children uh, that are being killed, and we have to discuss this. We have to respond to this. Uh, By Planned Parenthood alone since 1970 has been 8 million. So there are a number of different abortion providers. Sometimes people don't realize that Planned Parenthood's not the only one. But Planned Parenthood is one of the biggest, and they have aborted 8 million children since 1970. Uh, And at Planned Parenthood this year, 25,000. In the United States this year, 67,000. And in the U.S., after 16 weeks gestation, which we're going to talk about the differences between different phases of gestation and why some think some are okay and some aren't, after 16 weeks, there's been over 3,000 abortions, which is a, that's a huge amount of kids that are pretty well developed by 16 weeks. Right. Um, and this is an interesting statistic. Uh, there's been 659 abortions due to rape or incest this year. And oftentimes, we're going to get into this, but I'm just painting with broad strokes. Oftentimes, we'll hear um, as an argument uh, why abortions are okay is the rape and incest argument. And statistically, uh, we're going to look at the statistics, but if I remember off the top of my head properly, it's less than half a percent Mm -hmm. of abortions are actually due to rape or incest. So we're really talking about 
abortion for um, reasons other than that. Uh, we are going to address that reason as well. But the argument that that's why abortions should exist, it's it's less than half percent. It's not really the, the huge uh, number that it's presented as politically. Um, and then this is interesting. Um, something that folks might not know, the, the part there that says black babies since 73 in the U.S., 18 million um, uh, African-American babies have been aborted since 73. Something that people may not realize about Planned Parenthood, uh, but when you start to understand, um, you know, really what's going on in this country. Um, Margaret Sanger founded Planned Parenthood, um, and she actually, one, was a racist, but uh, specifically uh, moved Planned Parenthoods into black neighborhoods in order to reduce the black population. Um, So it is rooted uh, uh, at least Planned Parenthood's version of abortion is rooted um, in racism uh, and in, in eugenics, which eugenics, uh, essentially the belief behind eugenics is that there are races and peoples that are superior to others. Um, and if that's not racist, I don't know what is. So it's interesting. Um, I think that people who are categorically against racism or slavery or one race being superior to another, which I would agree that I'm categorically against those things, uh, would be so supportive of an organization whose roots are in the extermination of the black race. Um, and as you can see, that 18 million number since 73 uh, really shows that, and that's just in the United States, really shows that there has been a real push s- historically uh, against the black communities. Um, and so these are things to consider when we talk about this topic. You know, it, it can be a, a heavy topic, um, but it's something that needs to be discussed. We do need to um, not only discuss it, but take steps to stop this from happening in our country. Uh, something else that you might find pretty wild worldwide. Since 1980, oh my goodness, a billion, a billion abortions, 1.4 billion, you can see in that top right clock there. Worldwide this year, 2.9 million. Since you loaded this page, 5,000. And I loaded this page, let's see, at seven. When did I load it? I loaded it at six, I think. I had pulled this up around six o'clock. And then worldwide today, 87,000. So. As you can see from these numbers, um, this problem is enormous. It's something that is affecting the United States and the entire world, and it's actually not anything new. Right. Something we see in Scripture is that the killing of children, specifically children at all kinds of ages, um, has always been uh, something that has existed in human society. Um, and it is, it's a very barbaric practice that has continued on today. Um, that uh, is is truly it's it's evil it's it's and we're going to talk about why it is but it's evil it's hurting um, an actual human being taking their life from them um, when they're at their most vulnerable state so you know Mary what do you think about all of these numbers I know that you were kind of surprised by the worldwide number when I had shown it to you mm-hmm. earlier today what's what's your response to you know this this obvious crisis that we're experiencing worldwide. Um. When we look at these numbers, it's quite clear that this is a holocaust. Yeah. And what do we as Christians do in response to a holocaust? Right. So what does Christianity look like in a nation that sacrifices its own children? Yeah. And you had mentioned before that yeah. this this is something that's been going on since the beginning of time. You look yes. back through scriptures and people were sacrificing their children to the god of Moloch. Yeah. So it's nothing new. Yeah. And anytime there's been a great evil in the world, there's been people who stand up against it. Yes. And I think that as Christians, we are called to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And and it doesn't have to be specifically you're called to fight abortion. Right. I think that every Christian can do something in some way to fight this. Yes. Because this is national sin. This isn't just... Yeah. Um, we're picking people personally out and calling them out for their sin. This is a national thing that's going on. Absolutely. And and I believe, um, you, we're going to get into the scriptures on this topic, but I do believe that, biblically speaking, um, 
from the scriptures, it's very clear that God values human life, so we ought to, Mm -hmm. uh, and that human life actually begins not only in the womb, but even before the womb, which we're going to take a look at. Um, and, And therefore, this is a spiritual problem, not just an earthly problem. These human beings, their bodies, absolutely, but there are spirits that God has given to those bodies, um, spirits that God has foreknown, that he has created, that he has given life, um, and we're taking that life from them. And when you start to see the personhood of a human being at every stage of life, Mm -hmm. even when that person is only a thought in God's mind, it can start to help you to see the value of a human being. So maybe you are uh, tuning in and you are pro-life and, and, and you're tuning in just to kind of understand even better, uh, you know, what your convictions are um, and what the Bible says about the topic, but maybe you're tuning in and you are pro-choice. Maybe you're a mom who's pregnant um, and uh, you are considering abortion. Um, it, I believe that it's God that brought you to this video um, because he loves you. Um, he cares about you. Your life has value. Um, and the child within you has value. And we believe that being pro-life really means that all life is valuable at all stages and should be cared for and nurtured and taken care of. And something that I want to point out to maybe pro-lifers that are watching or or Christians, you know, believers that are watching uh, that are pro-life because of their Christian convictions. Um, I want you to remember that the person who supports abortion, who's pro-choice, supports abortion, who has had abortions, who is pregnant considering abortion, that that person is just as valuable as the person in the womb that you're defending. It's important to remember that even our opponents or people who are aggressively against us, um, those people have value. And we have to if we're going to value human life, we have to value all human life, including people who are Mm -hmm. in opposition to what we believe. And so with that, we're going to start off with the scriptures. We'll get into scriptures this evening, and then we're going to take a look at some of the statistics, um, some of the science behind why human life is valuable, why it starts at conception, and also um, uh, what abortion procedures are, what uh, takes place um, uh, when a baby is aborted, I, we're also going to hear a testimony from a woman who was raped um, and chose not to abort, um, but kept the baby. And um, it's a powerful story. I hope you'll stick around for it. It's going to be very good. But before we do, before we get into all that, let's get into the intro, and then we will get started. Thank you all for joining us. He is greater. The goal here... Oh, I caught you. I caught you drinking your coffee. (laughs) The goal here with this show, and even with the topic that we're talking about tonight, what is the Christian response to abortion? The goal with this show is really to make Jesus's thoughts on things greater than, than ours, to adopt the thoughts of Christ and make them our own, to actually have the mind of Christ to, to think and act in the same way that Christ does. And so as we look at this question as we look at this issue of abortion, we want to come at it as, well, how does Jesus respond to this? How does the scriptures respond to this? How does God feel about this? Because that's who I want to be in line with. That's who I'm going to stand before at the end of this life. That's who I'm going to be accountable to. That's who has decided what's right and wrong. And that's who has given every human being value. So I want to go to him. I want to make him greater, his thoughts greater than my own. I think sometimes we get wrapped up in the the thoughts of other human beings, or the thoughts of culture, the thoughts of society, um, and we elevate those above the Bible or above Jesus Christ, even as Christians, but obviously even as a nation we've done that. Um, uh, and we've got to return to Jesus being the greatest, the highest source of authority, the first, the, the, the last, the one who's above all things, and in him all things hold together. That's how we want to view this. And so as we talk about this topic tonight, we're looking at it from how does Jesus respond to this? Because I want to be aligned with Christ. And when I stand before him on Judgment Day, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to have lived in a way that pleased him. And when I did sin, that I repented, changed my mind on those things, and started doing the right thing. And so tonight, I I hope that you'll have an open mind, no matter where you're coming from on the spectrum, of what does 
God have to say on this? What is the right thing? And maybe you're not a believer. Well, what does science have to say about where life starts and, and why a human being has value at, at all stages? Um, but I think if you come at it with that mentality of, let's consider uh, the approach the the opposing views. If you if you happen to be pro-choice, let's consider the opposing views. Um, you might come to learn something tonight that you didn't know before, um, and as a result of elevating Jesus's words above anyone else's, you can come to know the truth, and you can be set free from deception. That's really what Jesus does. He sets us free from deception. So to get started, we'll take a look at the uh, passages this evening, and we're going to start with Second Timothy chapter 2. Let me pull it up for you guys. Here we go. There is a link down in the description that you guys can click and you can follow along um, uh, and uh, actually see these passages. So if you go down in the description, you can see them. But Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. This really, the reason why I included this passage is um, because obviously there's some serious contention on this issue. Um, those of you who are pro-life, you have opponents who are pro-choice, um, and we want to know how to respond to our opponents. We want to know how to approach this thing properly. Uh, like I was saying just a moment ago, that all life has value. Even our opponents, mm-hmm. their life is is very precious, very valuable. God wants them to come to repentance and to know the truth, and sometimes he sends us as the vessel. And so we're not looking for a fight with people. We're mm-hmm. looking to uh, gently share the truth with them, that they might come to know what the truth is and start doing the right thing, uh, which results mm-hmm. in lives being saved. And oftentimes people don't really see the error in their thinking immediately, right. and we don't have to be the ones to bring them to that place. Oh, you yeah. can plant that Great seed point. and not get frustrated with them because, yeah. oh, they're not logical enough, they're not thinking this through. Right. And I think that's where a lot of quarrelsome attitudes come from, yeah, and is we want to win the debate. Absolutely. And so. and I, we have to remember something, that there's a spiritual deception, even Scripture calls it an actual blindness, a spiritual blindness. So you can't be angry at someone for having a, a level of blindness on a spiritual issue or on an issue that has to do with Christianity. Um, even when you're dealing with another believer who maybe has gotten sucked into deception, the appropriate response is still to be gentle to that person and to help them to understand so that they might come to repentance, so that they can right. actually see the light, um, very literally see the light and see the truth. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 through 26, really addresses this. And this applies not just to the pro-life, pro-choice um, talk, but also um, uh, any time that we have an opponent, whether it's doctrinally or it, whether it's between a believer and an unbeliever or two believers talking about something, this is how this is the kind of attitude that we're supposed to take with that person. So starting from verse 24, it says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. So that's important. We're not looking to start quarrels. We're, we're to be kind to everybody able to teach, able to instruct, and not be resentful when they don't agree with us, which really right. what is what goes along with what you were just mm-hmm. saying. Like, how often do we... I think it's our ego. Our pride gets right. a little bit hurt because they didn't believe what we said, and then we exactly. take it personally, and then we're kind of resentful towards that person. Right. <laughs> we don't want to get into that yeah. mindset with people. Um, and when you approach people that think differently from you... It's so important to not have a, hey, I'm superior to you attitude. Because the truth is, maybe you're not deceived in one area. You could be in another, and you'd need mercy as well. Or maybe you've been deceived in other areas or even in this area in the past, and so you want to be gentle to people just like you would want people to be gentle to you. If you don't know the truth, but you don't know that you don't know the truth, wouldn't you want someone to come along and kindly, not resentfully, gently share it with you. And that's the point that Timothy's making here. So he continues on in verse 25. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So that's supposed to be our response to people who are Mm -hmm. in opposition to what we think. We're gently instructing them. We're hoping that God will grant them repentance, that they'll come to know the truth. Um, And it even says that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. Which reminds me that Scripture says we wrestle not with flesh and blood. 
Right. But with principalities and powers of darkness. It's a spiritual battle, ultimately. It really is. When an individual doesn't know the truth, you're dealing with spiritual deception. Mm -hmm. That's why we can't be evil or rude or resentful or even aggressive or violent with someone who is in opposition to us because it's a spiritual issue that we're dealing with. Right. Right. I think a lot of times we, as Christians, can get very um, frustrated with people who work in the abortion industry. And I think Corey Ten Boom is a great example. If you yeah. guys know who she is, she spent tell time. Tell us. Tell us about her. She spent time in a concentration camp for hiding Jewish people during World War II. And her attitude towards the people that had taken her captive and had taken um, the Jewish people captive was one of such grace and patience and mercy yeah. that we it's not that we don't speak the truth to them, yeah. but... Speak the truth in love, speak the truth Scripture in love. says. Yeah, so. yeah. absolutely. I, I totally agree. The response that we want to have to everybody, to the mothers, to the abortion doctors, to the nurses, to the pro-choice advocates, is to be gracious. Yes, we speak the truth. We don't be ashamed of the truth. We don't back down from the truth. But we are gentle. We are kind. What did Timothy say? That we're kind. We're not quarrelsome. We're not resentful. We're gentle. Opponents must be gently instructed. See, sometimes we're losing the battle because we're speaking the truth, but we are so prideful and aggressive and like, um, uh, I don't know, assertive over the person right? that it brings up these huge walls. They don't even hear the truth that we're saying. It becomes kind of just this toe-to-toe battle of, like, right. who can who can demonstrate more pride? And I've seen that on the pro-life side, too. Like, I've seen pro-life sure. people have this aggressive attitude, and the other person just, it's just like the lights go out. It's like the wall mm-hmm. goes up, and it's like, I'm not listening. Right. And that's not effective. That's not an effective method of communication. We're not really so. going to help people by just having them put up their walls immediately. Mm-hmm. We have to be gracious with people. If I was under deception, if I if I believe that life begins at conception and that every life has value and that the only thing that separates me from from a child uh, uh, in the womb is time, if I believe that that's the only thing, that that's not you know just a clump of cells or a parasite or the different types of words, if I believe that that's a human life, then I need to respond to people gently who don't understand that because if I didn't understand it, I would want people to help me know. If something really is true, if we make truth, veritas, our highest goal, then we ought to be gracious to people who don't know the truth, because we want people to be gracious to us when we don't know the truth. Yep. Did you know that Scripture in Jude says, be merciful to those who doubt? Be merciful to those who doubt. If it wasn't for God being merciful to you in your walk with Him, in your doubts, in your believing the wrong things, in your uh, accepting falsehoods, in your committing sins that you thought weren't sins. If it weren't for God being merciful to you, where would you be, not only in life, but what would your eternity look like? Mercy is essential to helping people come to know the truth. And without it, people actually don't come to know the truth. The reason I'm not in rebellion to God anymore and to his law and to his word is because he's been merciful to me when I didn't deserve it and I didn't know that I was such an enemy of his. Exactly. And that's... We just have to realize, like, where we came from. I don't know. Yeah. We want to bring God's mercy to every person because it's mercy that changes things. If you know someone who has aborted, don't be unmerciful to that person. Even if they still support abortion, just share with them how much God loves them. And in fact, that God loves their baby and that their baby has lived on beyond that human body. Share with them that God cares about them and their future children that they might have. Share with them that God forgives them and has mercy for them if they believe in Jesus and repent of their sins, that they'll be forgiven of everything and that God, they are completely in, in, in right standing with God through Jesus. Share these kinds of things with a person. And that Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say the reality is one third of women have had abortions. So you probably know quite a few women in your life who have had abortions, whether or not yeah, they're whether they've talked uh, about open it or about not. it or yeah. not. Yeah. 
Um, so I think a lot of times we we might ostracize people when we're so disgusted, right? I guess. And I don't want to like downplay it because abortion is a very grievous thing. It yeah. is a sin against God. It is murder, and yeah. we can boldly say those things because sure. God is a God who forgives murderers. Right. But we're literally all murderers, even if it's just in our hearts. Right. Right. So. Scripture says that he that hates his brother is guilty of murder. So, you know, if you've ever had any sort of unforgiveness or hate towards another human being, mm-hmm. you get counted as a murderer according to Scripture, and hence why we need God's grace right. so so and desperately. <laughs> separated from God, we're all capable of murder as well. Absolutely, so. yeah. Just think of that when you think of the women you might know. Yeah, absolutely. To be merciful, yeah. because we need mercy as well. Blessed are the merciful, Jesus said, for they will receive mercy. All right, so we're going to take a look at the scriptures. We're going to start at the scriptures, what the scriptures have to say uh, about human life and its value, and where does that value begin? I think that with everything, we ought to ask the creator of all things what he says about human life, when it begins, when it has value, you know, how to respond to it at each stage of life because he's the one who's designed the whole system. So let's take a look. We'll start at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. And I thank you all who are tuning in and watching. We appreciate you guys. Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says this. This is God speaking. He says, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Sometimes people, they really get hung up on the terminology pro-life, you know, pro-choice. And and something I often share with people is God is pro-choice. What do I mean by that? Before everybody, everybody's heads explode. Oh what do gosh, I mean I'm by leaving. that phrase? I that God that. is pro-choice. <laughs> what I mean by that is that God, according to Deuteronomy 30, 19, has set before everyone life and death, blessings and curses. And he says, now choose life. So he wants you to choose life, but he's given you choice. Right. We have a every choice. person has choice. We have choices all throughout our day. I, every day. To make good or bad choices. Yeah. So. Yeah. And to make choices that lead to life. Um, life continuing, life prospering, life being abundant. God has given us these choices and opportunities. And I think overall, really, the, the pro-life uh, a stance should be one of that we want to see a person live the best life possible. I want to see the mother have the best life possible. And I believe that abortion actually hurts that mom. Emotionally, spiritually, physically hurts mm-hmm. that mom. And so when I say, like, yes, you have the choice, I believe God's given you the choice. What I'm saying is that, yes, we have choices, but God has given us blessings and curses, life and death. Choose life, is what he says. Choose life so that you and your children may live. God's will here is that we choose, make decisions that lead to life, continuing here on earth and continuing eternally. Choose life, God says, that you and your children may live. I Just that passage alone really resonates with me that if I were ever in a decision where I needed to choose to kill someone or not kill someone, it seems that God errs on the side of we need to choose life. We need to choose and make the decisions that lead to life, that lead to peace, that lead to an abundant living. Because I believe that that's God's will for us. Choose life so that you and your children may live. God wants to bless you as a mother and as a father. And God wants to bless your children and give them a wonderful life and them have you raise them. God loves families. God loves people. One of the first things that he told Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply, to have a family, to have children, to start to spread across the earth. Why? Because God loves people and he loves lots of people. He's given us this big earth to live on, and he loves having more and more people. He wants us to choose life. He wants us and our children to live. He wants us to come to repentance. He wants us to believe in Jesus. Above everything, not just saving your baby, he wants to save you. 
See, when you believe in him, he gives you this whole new life. Before, you might have been being deceived into thinking, well, you're, the baby that's in your womb doesn't have value. That's a gift from God. It's one of many. And one of the other gifts that he's given, the greatest gift, is his son, Jesus, the gift of grace. Jesus dying on the cross for every sin, every wrong you've ever committed so that you could be in fellowship with him. If you feel like you need to abort because you're lacking something, the thing that truly is lacking and the reason why life hasn't satisfied is the relationship with the Creator who loves you. This is what every human being needs desperately. This is why we feel that void, is because we don't have that. And when we do, when we choose life, when we believe in Jesus, when we embrace the children that the Lord has given to us, he gives us this wonderful and incredible life. It doesn't mean we never have troubles, but he gives us this incredible life. And that's what I believe God wants for each person. It's why he says, choose life. We don't all choose life. We don't all end up actually making the right decisions. We don't all repent. We don't all believe in Jesus. And as a result, we do end up suffering. But God's will, Scripture actually says that God wills that, that uh, all men would come to repentance, that all people would be saved. He wants you to be in relationship with you. He wants you to be in relationship with him. He wants to demonstrate his love to you. That baby that God has given you is a precious gift. Choose life. Amen, Mary? Amen. So Deuteronomy 30.19 really gets, gets it started that, that God wants us to choose life so that we and our children may live. And then Psalm 139 13 through 16, this passage really starts to shed light on what's going on inside of the womb between a human being and God, like what's actually taking place? What is God doing? Is that a person that's inside of a woman? Or is that just an organ, you know, an extension of the woman temporarily and it eventually becomes a person? And I think Psalm 139 really starts to shed light on what's going on in there. So, so um, let's read it together. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16 says this. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That passage is both beautiful and true. And if I could add yes. to God knitting people together in yes. their mother's womb. Please. Uh, when God became flesh, he didn't become flesh as a man or as a baby yes, or right. as a child or anything else. He became flesh right. in the womb. and that, So I think that adds to the understanding that Clearly, it's a human being in the mother's womb. Biblically, from a Christian perspective. Yeah. So so first we're addressing, if you're a believer, mm -hmm. if you're a Christian, what does the Bible say? And it really, even just from two passages, it seems that God wants us to choose life. He, yes, he's given us choice. Yes, in his sovereignty, he's bestowed that upon man, that he set before them life and death, blessings and curses. But his stance and his will is choose life. Right. And I don't know if this is going a little off topic, but no, when go God gives you choices between life and death, yes. it's not like he's just leaving you out on your own. He is giving you signs. He's giving you a way out. Yes. He's going to be there with you during that right. journey. So if you seek Christ, he is going to provide ways out. Yeah, absolutely. So we see in Psalm 139, I'll bring it back up for you guys, for you created for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Okay, something spiritual is taking place in the womb. Yes, we see the science of it. Yes, we take pictures in the womb, but there's a spiritual thing taking place. The scriptures say that it's actually God who's knitting together that life. And so the point can be made that when we interfere with that, we are interfering with the very work of God, that it's God actually knitting together that human life in that womb and that we're actually resisting the will of God, because it's him doing that work in that person. He has equipped the mother with, with everything necessary in, in order to do that. But if you think about that, even God made the mother, and so on and so on and so on. So he is the one at work creating life. 
And then it goes on and says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Each person is fearfully and wonderfully made. If you, maybe you're not a believer and you're watching, maybe you are, I want you to understand that you are so precious to God. See, in the midst of you being a sinner and being an enemy of God and doing wrong and doing evil things, and we all have, like every single one of us has done evil things, or even if we didn't do something evil in act, we went through it in our heart and would have if we were given the opportunity. So we are all of us, we do evil things. But something that we learn from Scripture is that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are valued by God. And in fact, we are so valued that in the midst of our sin, God comes and dwells among us in Christ. Scripture says Christ poured himself out of his glory, of his kingship, of of all of these things, and he became like a man. And he dwelt among men. And like Mary said, he came through a mother. He went through all those stages of life that we do. And he comes and he dies on the cross for every single person. You, the baby in your womb, everyone. And what that tells us about God's nature is that he does value us, even though we've done wrong. It doesn't matter if you spent your whole life as an atheist. It doesn't matter if you spent your whole life uh, doing sinful things. God will, can, and will forgive you of all of it when you believe in Jesus. And he sent Jesus because he loves you and because he values you. And he's given, if you are pregnant and you come across this video, he's given you that baby because he loves you and values you. And that baby is a gift from him. God calls children a gift and a heritage. Yes. So if God was going to give you a brand new car, you'd probably be like, oh, that's awesome. I'll take that. Right. You know, oftentimes we are like, oh, a kid? I don't want to take care of a kid. That's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. What do you mean that's a gift? What are you talking about, God? Well, and that's that's an interesting point to make because a lot of times people go to God and they want a car Mm -hmm. or they want a house. You know what I'm saying? And like... God specifically lists like a few gifts in scripture. Grace through Christ is one. Mm -hmm. And also babies (laughs) is another. So like we elevate these things, these really, really earthly things above these much more precious things. The the son of God, our own children, you know, these are real gifts that God Mm -hmm. has given. And, And God has done that for you because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He loves you. He loves you. It doesn't matter if you've been pro-choice your whole life and and you um, don't even like God. Uh, the beauty of how this thing works is that the scriptures say <laughs> that God loved us first. That he loved us first. So if you've never loved God, it he still loves you. And when you were in your mother's womb, just like the passage is saying, he was knitting you together. Why? Because you are precious to him. Those of you who are alive, who are pro-choice, you are alive because God gave you life and knit you together in your mother's womb. It was a spiritual miracle that you are here. You are a miracle of God. Anything that God does is a miracle. So the fact that it's him knitting together bodies in wombs makes you a miracle. I believe that that's really something that the Lord wants our viewers tonight to know that you are loved and that the baby that you have within you today in the future is loved as well. And so he continues on. We'll look at Psalms again. 139, verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, which starts to give a little bit of insight into when this weaving begins. It actually begins before the womb. Verse 16, you, your eyes saw my unformed body. What does that mean? It means that God recognized the personhood of David here, but any person, recognized the personhood and humanity and ordained that they were a person before their body was even formed. So scripturally, a person is a person not because of a body nor its stage of life, but because God God says that that is a person. 
The body is the vessel that God gives to a person, but the person exists before the body. And so that means that a human being has value before the body even is formed. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Meaning that God has purpose. Do you know what that means? Verse 16 means that your life has purpose. If God has granted you the gift of having a child, it's because he has good purpose for that child and for you. No matter what, no matter what kind of struggles and difficulty you've been through getting to this point, God has not given up on you. If there is breath in your lungs, there is still time to repent and believe in his son Jesus. Be forgiven of everything and start new. That old life can die. Scripture actually says that we, we die. We, we die when we come to know Jesus. We die and then we are reborn into a new life. That's If you've ever heard the term, you know, a, a born-again Christian, that's really where it comes from, is that we are spiritually reborn in Christ, that we start off as a whole new creature with Jesus. And so no matter what decisions have led up to having maybe this unexpected pregnancy that you're experiencing, I want you to know that your life has purpose and that God has goodness lined up for you if you will only trust in Him. The main reason we get into so much trouble is because we don't trust in Him. Exactly. We, we go off on our own tangents. We go off on what politicians and culture and society tells us to do. And then we end up hurt and harmed and suffering. Why? Because we were listening to what man told us to do with our life instead of the creator of man. See, our sin leads to death and yes, ultimately spiritual death, but it can lead to our physical death and And will, abortion. in fact, lead to our physical death eventually. Right. Sometimes faster than other exactly. times. Yeah. But abortion is another way that our sin leads to death, is we have sinned and fallen short, and so we're going to take this unexpected pregnancy into our own hands yeah. and ultimately murder our child. Yeah. Um, but we, we can look at the cross and say, Christ has already died for our sins. We don't yes. have to shed any more innocent blood. Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe that's absolutely the correct response. You have purpose. No matter who you are, where you are watching this, you have purpose, you have value, you have value, and that's the reason why a baby in a womb has value as well, because God is what gives us our value. Let's take a look at Jeremiah. I'm going to pull it up here. Sorry. I hope you guys are enjoying this talk tonight. We really appreciate you tuning in. Let's pull up Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Also shows that God um, uh, knows us as a person, recognizes us as a human being, as a person, um, uh, before we're even in the womb. Jeremiah 1, 5 says this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. This really is a great follow-up to the psalm passage because he's talking to the prophet Jeremiah and he's making this point that I knew who you were before you were even formed, before your body was even a body. Before I even gave that to you, I gave you personhood. I gave you existence. I brought you into reality before the womb. So the argument oftentimes always comes down to like different stages in the womb. And I believe actually biblically, the truth is a person's a person before the womb. Yeah. And God has given us value. Yeah. He doesn't give us value whenever our fingers grow in the womb or whenever yeah. our hearts start beating or whenever the brain waves start. Yeah. He gives us value before all of that happens. Right. Human beings have so. tried to erroneously apply value to electrical impulses or a heartbeat at 22 days or even con- DNA at conception. And those are all excellent right. you know, um, uh, examples of what's taking place that prove that a human being is a human being and that life is taking place. Because they're but, developing. Yeah, you know. and, and that's absolutely true, and, and it's great to share that knowledge. But I think even deeper than that spiritually is that God knows a person before all that. <laughs> Mm-hmm. They wouldn't exist if it wasn't for God sovereignly appointing them to exist. It's his purposes. It's his divine will. It's his plans that have been set in motion that bring a person into being. And what, is, what does God say to the prophet Jeremiah? He says, before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations, meaning I gave you purpose before you were even in the womb. You had a life plan. I cared about you. I knew you. I loved you. 
I set you apart. I appointed you. And that's, I believe that's true. Obviously, we see that with Jeremiah, but I believe that's true with every single person. That every person has purpose, that God has created them with purpose. And the first and most important purpose of every person is to be in relationship with their Creator, to know the Lord Jesus and His love for you and His sacrifice on the cross for you and His reality and the power, His life changing power. I can't, I, it's hard to describe how much God blesses a person's life when they forsake everything earthly and start to follow and obey the Word of God and serve God and and trust in God and have faith in God and let it all go. It really is faith. You really have to just take Him at His Word and do what He says and start living the way that He says. And then what you start to see is your faith increases because God keeps His promises. Your life becomes this incredible, abundant life that Jesus has promised. doesn't mean that there's never trouble, but what's different from the trouble before Jesus and the trouble after is you have Jesus with you through it. And so as we go through troubles, as we go through hardships, one, we're given this hard-to-explain peace as we go through them, and two, we're delivered from them. They might come on us for a season, but God delivers us from them. And so life truly improves dramatically when you come to follow Jesus. And I believe that's the first purpose that God has given to every person to know him, to be in love with him, uh, and, 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 and to follow him and trust him in every decision that they make, including their decisions with their body and with their children. Because each person is valued before they're even in the womb, according to God. I mean, that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty amazing to see, mm-hmm. because I, I do see Christians often, they really stick at, and I'm, I think science is wonderful, but they, right. really, they really go at it from the scientific standpoint, and, and, and that's great, and I think battle. we do need to share that. But we have to remind people spiritually that they have inherent value because God says so, right. not because their, their little electrical impulses or right. pulses are going off in their brain. You know? I mean, people sacrificed their children to the God of Moloch, and they were fully developed born children. Yeah, yeah. And... People took Jews captive and tortured them and yeah. killed them in concentration camps. Yeah. And they were clearly developed human beings. Yeah. So we can yeah. do evil things to developed human beings. And, and back in slavery, we kidnapped and enslaved Africans. Yeah. So absolutely. And other countries have enslaved all, all yeah. sorts of different people have been enslaved all across the world. So this is like something that humanity has done, killing one another, devaluing each other. This is nothing right. new. And that's why it's spiritual. It's not just abortion. It's it's really just the devaluing of human life. And that's why mm-hmm. we want to go to Scripture and find out how valuable a person right. is, because you, it's God who sets a person's value. You ultimately can't tell somebody that just because they have a heartbeat or they're developed that they're valuable. Right. They're going to come up with another reason why they're not. Right. Unless you address the spiritual issue. Right. We have to address it so. spiritually. Absolutely. And that's why we're starting here with these passages to kind of make that point that this really is a spiritual issue first before it's ever scientific. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. You actually mentioned this passage, oh, yeah. Mary. So you are like on the Holy Spirit wavelength here tonight. Psalm 127, 3 through 5 says this. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Other translations say gift. And the point that that the, the psalmist is making is that when a person has a child, that that's a heritage from the Lord, meaning God, God has counted your bloodline worthy of continuing. That's a huge... That's a huge kindness that God has shown to a person. And then the offspring are an actual gift directly from him. In the same way that Jesus yeah. is a gift directly from him, the most precious gift that we've received. Children are precious like that in that they are this reward from him. What does that tell you about how we should respond to somebody who maybe is having sex outside of marriage and they get pregnant? Yes, As Christians, we believe that that's a sin, that God has designed sex to be something that we have within marriage. And so oftentimes Mm -hmm. what you'll find from the pro-life believers or or from Christians is that we believe that you should practice abstinence, you know, when you're unwed um, in order to prevent even the need for abortion. Um, uh, But ultimately what, what we're coming at is that sex is designed for marriage in order to produce life. It's a blessing from God to produce life. And once we've had a child, no matter how that's been conceived, even outside of marriage, 
it's God giving a good gift, even if that person has sinned. And that says something about God's nature. And I think oftentimes he gives a child in those situations as a reminder, like, no, this is why I've created sex. And now you're responsible for another human life. And it's a gift. Yeah, right. So absolutely. Yeah. And it's another choice between life and death. Because yes. you either see one or two things when people have children outside of wedlock is more destruction. Yes. Uh, their children end up in foster care or abuse situations. If not or aborted, yeah. The couple ends up married and raising the child and having yeah. a family together. Yeah, so it's absolutely. another choice, life and death. Right. Life and so. death. And that's that's throughout everywhere. So, you know, we, we understand that there are choices to be made, but just that we there God clearly he makes it clear that there's a good choice and a bad choice in each thing that we, every decision that we come to in life. And God actually wants to bless us and help us to make the right choice. I, I often teach people this, that every command that God has given is actually for your benefit. It's not to ruin your fun. It's not to hurt you. It's actually to defend you from harm, protect you from the schemes of the devil, from destruction, from hardship, from pain, and to heal you and restore you and help you. Every single command is meant to benefit those who obey that command and the neighbors yeah. around the person. So not only are you benefited by, for example, we're talking about abortion, by having the baby, but your baby's benefited because they get to have life and enjoy it and be loved by their parents. So good comes from that decision. And and you're absolutely right that that's how every decision works. We have this life and death, blessings and curses. And curses can produce curses, can produce curses, can produce curses, or we can repent and start making those right decisions and start to experience life. Understanding yeah. that children are a reward. And somewhere where I was going with with um, offspring being a reward from him, we've talked about this privately some, but as Christians, we really historically have been really hard on people who have gotten pregnant outside of wedlock. Um, and I'm not saying we're the sole, you know, killing children has been throughout humanity, throughout human history, but we're not the sole reason for this. But I think our judgment of moms... Um, who have had children out of wedlock, especially historically, maybe we don't judge them as much today, but especially right. historically, Christians have been pretty critical of women who had mm-hmm. children outside of wedlock. Parents were hard on them, churches were hard on them, culture was hard on them, because culture was predominantly identifying as Christian, but being fairly right. judgmental towards any sinner, um, forgetting that they themselves are sinners, that we help to foster this environment of abortion. Of shame around being a single mom. Right. Of shame around even the fact that they've had sex outside of wedlock. Right. We've we've shamed people historically, even if it's not the same reason today, if it's more economical today. Mm-hmm. We really helped kickstart this this need and desire for abortion by how heavy we have judged and condemned and shamed women who are getting pregnant outside of marriage. Because mm-hmm. families would shun their children, their daughters... Families would uh, uh, really look down on them. Churches would shun them. And so as a result, women started to become so fearful of having a kid outside of wedlock within their Christian community that they started to think that perhaps ending that life and having never been pregnant in the first place publicly, nobody ever knew, was the better option. So in a way, it's still it was social then, it's social today. It might be mm-hmm. so, socioeconomic today, right. but it was similar in that it was still a social issue between human beings feeling shamed and, and then ending a human life mm-hmm. as a result. And just the cu- church culture today is yeah. all about image. You yeah. kind of hide every little thing that you do that's not in the perfect Christian image. Yeah, yeah. And it ultimately ends in... Like yeah, catastrophe. That's the word I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah, and it's it's why it's so important that if somebody is sinning and they're having sex outside of marriage and they do get pregnant, that we do rally around that mother and support that mother. It's not that we're condoning their sin. I often hear this argument from right. anything when you're kind to a homosexual, oh, you're condoning their sin. Um, and you know we won't go down that rabbit hole, but we 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 respond to sins this way that somehow mm-hmm. we're condoning them. And it's interesting because it, with that with that sort of uh, thinking, that sort of logic, then God giving them a child is him condoning their sin. Like, 
He yeah. gave them something good out of their sin. And really what it is, is it's God showing kindness to the ungrateful and wicked. That's what scripture says. When we've been ungrateful, when we've been wicked, God shows kindness to us. And that we're supposed to do the same thing. It's never a condoning. If somebody is kind to a homosexual, a practicing homosexual, or somebody who's been uh, in adultery, or someone who has been divorced and has remarried, and they divorced and it's counted biblically as adultery. If someone's had sex outside of marriage and they're pregnant, or they're just simply having sex outside of marriage, the response is, one, maybe I've already I've made the same decisions, so I need to have mercy on you, too. But two, even if I've never made the same decisions, I'm able to. It's very possible for me to do so if it weren't if we're not for the grace of God. Uh, and three, that we're supposed to show kindness to people who are making mistakes so that they might come to repentance. The goal is to show people God's goodness in the midst of their sin. That's what really turns a person. What turns you from your sin? Yes, you do need to understand the weight of your sin. Absolutely. You've got to repent from something when you repent. So you understand that you are sinning. But what really gets a person's heart when they come to Christ repeatedly, when you hear testimonies, it's that they were loved in the midst of all those sins. As they learned about all their sins and how much of an enemy they were of God, that they were loved, that God was still doing kind things for them that were undeserved. Grace is undeserved. Why do we think that people have to be deserving of grace, whether it's abortion or other sexual uh, sins that lead to um, uh, all sorts of different types of consequences or hardships or what have you? Why do we think that uh, we shouldn't show undeserved grace when that's exactly what grace is? It's not earned. It's not worked for. So I think we need to err on the side of mercy and stop with this 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 heavy judgment of women when they get pregnant outside of marriage if anything let's one rally around her support her in the in the in the pregnancy two if there's a father involved help their relationship to prosper help them to see why marriage uh, uh, is is uh, a positive decision the right decision that would help them in their relationship together and then help that family to succeed in their marriage raising their children so their children don't go into foster care don't um, uh, end up uh, even after living, experiencing hardship. So there's a lot that the church can do that we mm-hmm. aren't doing. And and we, yeah, we might vote pro-life, which is, that's wonderful, great, thank you very much. What mm-hmm. are you doing in your daily life for people who are making unbiblical, sinful decisions? What are you doing for people that demonstrates God's grace and kindness to them and helps them to come to repentance? Because when you're kind to somebody, then they'll start to listen to what you have to say. That's true. <laughs> kindness builds trust. It's like, why are you talking to me? You don't know anything about my life. You don't right. know what I'm going through. Um, right. You don't care about me. And, you just and, like have and, an opinion. And we show up and we're aggressive. Right. And then we're not offering to like either maybe adopt their baby if they absolutely don't want it. We're not offering to do that. We're not offering to maybe help them with groceries or child care products. Mm-hmm. Like we're not supporting pregnancy crisis centers. Like we're not doing anything to actually help. We're just screaming pro-life at people. Right. <laughs> And you can't just vote pro vote pro life <laughs> and then call yourself well not call yourself a Christian because you are a Christian but say that you're doing the things that God has that's not to be the to end do. of it right. yeah spiritually so, that's not to be the end of it absolutely so we'll continue on with Psalms chapter one twenty seven three through five. And we read verse 3, so we'll read verse 4. It says, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. So the scriptures seem to indicate that a child is actually this wonderful um, gift. It's a get, They're a gift from God, but also that they're like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Like, like God is saying that he's equipping you for life, that you're actually mm-hmm. going to be more effective as a family yeah. together, overcoming life's obstacles. You're going to be able to overcome things as a result of the growth of your family together uh, as a single solid unit functioning together. Verse 5, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Like God is saying, you are blessed if you have a bunch of kids. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. So again, you know, it, 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 having this big family uh, really brings a lot of blessings to a person's life, can protect them from a lot of harm, so on and so forth. You know, um, it's, it's, it's something viewed very positively in Scripture. We really don't see in Scripture that God giving a child to a person 
uh, is actually a curse. It's actually not. It is a reward yeah. from God. Uh, in the midst of sin, God is showing them kindness, and that's how we're supposed to respond to somebody when they've gotten caught up in a sin. Maybe they're having sex outside of marriage. Maybe they're sinning sexually in other areas. We're supposed to respond with mercy. Why? Because it's the mercy of God that leads people to repentance. It's his kindness that leads thee to repentance. So when David um, had the child with Bathsheba, yes, God took that child from him as yes. a punishment, as a curse to him. Yeah. So the child was a gift that God had, ta- had right. taken from him. Yeah, good point. So that's another instance. So losing the child was see. actually, yeah. Losing the child was actually a result of sin. It wasn't actually a positive thing. Right. And he was very grieved over that because he... He knew that that was a precious gift. Yeah. No, absolutely. And he did say, that's actually, that brings up a good point um, uh, that uh, we can address really quick. David says, I will not, he will not return to me, but I will go to him. And he's talking about the child that that had passed away. Um, That really gives us some real insight to the fact that we are eternal beings and David knew that although he was not worthy of having that child at that time as a result of his sin, God had taken that child, that God was still kind and merciful, meaning that that child was in heaven uh, with the Lord, uh, yes. at the, and, and, and that David was going to go to him one day, that they would be together uh, reunited. This is true. This is powerful. Um, any Any woman who has aborted, and maybe you've repented and recognized, like, that was the wrong decision. I want you to know that God does forgive you when you repent any sin that we commit. God forgives us. It doesn't matter what it is that we've done. And that that child is still your child. God is taking care of them and that you will be reunited with that child because of because of what Christ has done for you. And so as you believe and trust in the Lord, your relationship with that baby that that um, whose life ended in the womb, your relationship with them did not end at the womb that your relationship will continue, and that God uh, is going to reunite you. Um, And so that's something that I think is important for maybe women who have been hurt by abortion, uh, which, you know, Planned Parenthood and all these organizations try and act like that's not reality. But women, um, uh, depression is very high among women who have had abortions. Um, Suicidal tendencies, even suicide. Um, There's you know, maternal deaths and all sorts of things as a result of abortion. So, you know, women are truly harmed from this thing. And I think part of that healing process, if you have aborted, is knowing that God loves you still and that he's taking care of your child and that your child has not ceased to exist. Like David knew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Romans chapter 2, verse 4, this is something I wanted to show you guys, which we were kind of uh, addressing it. But Paul makes this point about how it's God's kindness that leads people to repentance here in Romans. And he says this, Romans 2, 4, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? This is powerful coming from Paul, because what he's saying is, why are you being contemptuous? Why are you being angry with God? Why are you frustrated with God that he shows kindness to people when they're sinning? Because he was kind to you as a sinner, and it's what led you to repentance. And it's his kindness that he's he shows it, at, at, and it's intended to lead people to repentance. It's supposed to be. Yeah. The whole cross, this whole thing that we believe is an undeserved kindness that God shows mm-hmm. us, and it leads us to repentance. So we're supposed to be kind to people in order to help them come to yeah. repentance. Not aggressive, not contemptuous, not angry, not, mm-hmm. not you know, we can, we can be angry with the problem itself, uh, mm-hmm. even grieved. Uh, uh, you know, with what's going on. But the individuals involved, we do need to show kindness to them. Even though we're grieved by it, we show kindness to them. Why? Because we want to see them come to repentance and see the truth. Every abortion doctor that closes up their practice and stops doing that is saving lives. Every mother that we love and and help support and she doesn't abort the baby is saving lives. This is how we actually solve the problem. I do believe in changing legislation, but even leading up to changing legislation and abolishing abortion, what we need to be doing is acting out in love towards our neighbors, showing them kindness. It's a cultural thing. It's like, it's deep seated in our culture. Yeah. So you actually have to change the culture. Right. You change never change the laws. Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of changing the culture is both working with legislation and changing the culture at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, and it all happens at once. But the truth is, culture is a result of the will of the exactly. people, especially in this country specifically. So we've got to help people to see mm-hmm. what what 
we have to love them into the truth. That's what I see. Is mm-hmm. we would be kind to them so that they'll come to repentance. We what did what did Tim what did Paul say to Timothy? We gently instruct our opposers. Right. We gently uh, instruct them so that why so that they might come to repentance. Same exactly. thing that Paul was saying in Romans two four. But to to accomplish that, we actually have to go out and talk to people. This we is have true. to interact with the world. We yes. can't just stay in our homes and in our churches. Or just at the ballot boxes. Yeah. Like we've got to interact with human beings. Yeah. We'll, we see we see how much that's done. Yeah. Just interacting yeah. politically. Yeah. So. Absolutely. And and we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can get involved, but just even briefly, um, obviously going to abortion clinics and being there as not somebody who wants to fight uh, or someone who wants to be aggressive mm-hmm. or scare women away from the abortion clinic, going there uh, w- in a spirit of gentleness and in love to support that mom. And <clears throat> and not just to support her that mm-hmm. day, but to make yourself available to continue to support um, right. both yourself, but leading her to resources like pregnancy crisis centers, mm-hmm. like, like different uh, uh, women's organizations that support women who are going through uh, a, a crisis pregnancy, an unexpected mm-hmm. pregnancy. Um, that's that's one of the, that's a great way. Uh, another one would be to support those actual pre- crisis pregnancy centers financially, or donating baby items, or volunteering to be a counselor, whatever mm-hmm. it might be. You know, getting involved, uh, uh, getting involved in the birthing industry, like yeah. like Mary has. You know, getting involved in in becoming a midwife. Or my wife is a birth doula, um, so that you can support services. women. Yeah, offering exactly. your services to women who are, um, you know, maybe scared of pregnancy and of birth. You're able mm-hmm. to be there as a support beam and help them through that process, which. I applaud you and applaud Brandy for mm-hmm. getting into that because I really believe that, that that's the solution is loving these mommies and, and helping them know that they're valued and supported and that they're not alone. Um, and, and ultimately that, that through us they see that God has not abandoned them and that they're not alone spiritually, that he's with them, that he loves them. Right. And I would say that um, going to the actual mills, I know yeah. um, historically it's seen as that's the craziest Christian you could right. possibly be. You stand with your crazy sign. Right. And you and yell you, and you judge women. Right. And you know. yell and, ju- and and that does happen sometimes. <laughs> that does but happen. that's that and it shouldn't be. And if you've been doing that, people. please don't do that. That's <laughs> not the way to do this. There are those people and I have been doing that for so long and a lot of times I get discouraged when those people show up and I'm like, God, yeah. I don't want them to see me as those people. Well, you know, so I, I have to make that sacrifice. Yeah. Like they might initially think I'm crazy. Yeah. But if God gives me the opportunity to actually speak with them and yeah. to offer help and the gospel, yeah. that is so much more valuable than somebody thinking I'm crazy. Well, then so. you kind of get into this situation where you're like, all right, I want to help the mommies, but I also got to kind of like get these Christians to chill out. So it's like, right. who should I address? You know? I mean, you can do both. Because I know, I right. Done. It's like, it's like, you've got to get into it with everybody because mm-hmm. even the people who are identifying as Christians, they're showing up so aggressive. And it truly, mm-hmm. truly, if you're, if you're someone who, who feels called, that's your ministry, you want to help women turn away from those clinics. I'm all mm-hmm. about that. But please go there in a spirit of gentleness. Right. Please. Please be supportive of those mommies. And I would say that I have been to so many abortion mills across the country. Yeah. And I've been doing it for almost 10 years now. Good for and you. the majority of people are not crazy. The majority yes, I of agree them will that. lay their lives down for these moms. Yeah. They will open their homes. They will give to them. They yeah. will adopt their babies. Yeah. Here in Orlando, a good friend of mine, yeah. um, a sidewalk counselor, him and his wife are adopting a baby that they met. That is wonderful. Um, a baby of the mom that they met outside at, at the abortion, the abortion clinic. Mill. Yeah. So that that is cool. That is amazing. Yeah. And, and I'd it, love to, I want to hear that story like in detail. Plug, not no plug because it's theirs. It's yeah. In his image ministries, you guys. In can his look image that ministries, up. check it out. So Genesis one twenty seven, and we'll continue to to keep it pacing. We're gonna finish up these scriptures here, and then talk about some of the science. And also, what are some of the things that you can do, like we were just mentioning, but in a little bit more detail? What are the, some of the things that you can do? Uh, like she mentioned, adopting, that's a huge part of, of the solution. When somebody's just totally decided in their mind that they're just going to give that baby up, why don't you be the family, if you're, if you're mm-hmm. really pro-life, why not be the family that adopts um, or helps to financially support an adoptive family who's adopting somebody who, who was going to be aborted? So Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 We'll get more into that towards the end. Um, It says this. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And that's pretty definitive, I think, uh, that mankind is made in God's image, that man can only produce man. Um, there, is, there, is, mm-hmm. uh, there is no chance of uh, a fetus, of a baby, um, uh, at any stage of life, becoming anything other than human. And therefore, um, the only difference between uh, uh, a, a, a born baby and one that's in the womb is time. It's not a different creature. Oftentimes we hear this kind of uh, language used like it's a parasite or it's a clump of cells. I hear those things. Parasite because it's feeding off of the mother's body. Clump of cells because it starts off as the, the egg and the sperm and then it starts to duplicate cells and so mm-hmm. on. It looks Before like a it starts to have clump for any form, right? So they say, "Oh, it's a clump of cells." You know, it, it doesn't. It's not a human being. But the truth is that it could only ever be a human being, mm-hmm. and therefore that is what it is. And it has human DNA, right? From from the moment of conception, it has human DNA. And so this is a person, and we see spiritually that God has known this person and ordained this person to exist before they were ever in the womb. So Mm -hmm. this, you know, maybe you're starting to see that biblically and spiritually, uh, and even scientifically, that this is a child and that that child is human. And what they do to dehumanize by using these terms are meant to kind of cast a shadow over Genesis 127 that we're created in his image, that that's all we could ever be is in his Mm -hmm. image. A person does not come out as a, a as a, a hybrid between an animal and a person or an, an animal. A woman's not going to give birth to a dog, ever. Um, it just doesn't happen. Kinds only repro- reproduce after their own kinds. You can only reproduce after your own kind. There is no such thing as a human being giving birth to anything other than a human being. And so... Right. It's important to understand that, that that's not just a scientific argument that people make. Mm -hmm. That's actually biblical, that you are created in God's image, that you have inherent value because you're in the image of God, that you um, uh, have been given life by God specifically. You've been given value by God. He's foreknown you, and it's him who decided sovereignly to make you in his image and to make you human, specifically human, male and female. God created them, Scripture says. That's where they're coming from, is from him, and they're in his image. All right. Yeah. I hope you guys on the stream are enjoying this. We appreciate you being part of it. Oh, man, every time I click over to YouTube, there it goes. Okay. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15. We'll pull that up. Says this, and this I wanted to make the point that God's love is even greater than even a mother's love. Like, this is how much God loves a person at every yeah. stage of their life. Isaiah 49, 15 says this, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. And that is a really great scripture for orphans. Yeah. Yes. Preach it. God, his response to every single person is even if our parents forget us that he hasn't forgotten us that he still loves us maybe maybe your parents did not abort you but they did put you into foster care you weren't adopted or maybe you were whatever has happened in your life your life has value you are loved you are not forgotten you are not abandoned i'm sorry that christians have not done more to welcome you into the body of Christ and to love you in the way that you deserve to be loved. But let me tell you that God loves you dearly and deeply. And even if your mother has forgotten you, God has not forgotten you. God continues to love you and care for you. And you as well, if you repent of your sins and believe, if you're in foster care, you've aged out of foster care. A, a lot of our viewers, you know that that my wife and I um, uh, we're the directors of a charity that houses and mentors young ladies who have aged out of foster care uh, to prevent sex trafficking and prostitution and, and a number of evils that attack foster children uh, when they've aged out of the system. You are inherently valuable, and your value is not even set by what your parents think of you. Your biological parents, your adoptive parents, your foster parents, it's great to be valued by human beings. It's wonderful. We ought to value one another. But when human beings fail to value you properly, I want you to know that God values you. 
even if your mother has forgotten you are valued. And that says something about abortion, though, too. Mm -hmm. Even when a mom is forgetting the value of that child, God values that child. And it's why exactly. we, as children of God, must continue that v to, to value that child and fight for that child's life, to stand mm -hmm. up for the weak and oppressed. That's, a, that's all throughout Scripture, that we're supposed to stand up for the vulnerable and for the weak. What is more vulnerable and weak than, than a child at the very beginning stages of life in the mother's womb? That is a human being at its weakest moment. Shouldn't we all the more be, <laughs> in the level of weakness that there is, shouldn't our strength be just as, as, as immense. If they're immensely weak, we should be immensely strong on their behalf. We need to, as believers, rise up and, and love these mothers and love the children that's within them. And if the mom is deciding, no matter what, that she wants to get rid of this baby, that we do stand up for that child's life and that we ensure that that, that child is given the opportunity to live because they are a human being their own DNA, all these scientific things, their own heartbeat at 22 days, they are inherently valuable because God has ordained for them to exist and has, has knit them together in the womb and knew them before they were even in the womb. That's why we must stand up for life. That's why, as a Christian, we must be um, uh, for life. We must choose life. It's a biblical command. That's why we started at Deuteronomy 30, 19. It is a biblical command for you and I mm -hmm. as believers to choose life right. in situations where there is a choice between the two, mm -hmm. that and we must choose it. As Christians, um, there can be a little bit of cognitive dissonance when it comes to an unborn baby. Yeah. And I think they're getting that from the culture, is that we don't see them, they're small, and yeah. they're in the mother's womb. Yeah. We kind of forget about them. Yeah. And it's this hot topic that yeah. we don't really want to get involved in that debate yeah so we just kind of stay silent yeah even yeah. though they are human beings and if you asked any christian if they thought that they would agree with you but our actions speak louder than words I yeah think we actually have to act like they're a human being yes think, and like what would you do if your neighbor owned slaves right what would you do you if have to you step up and stop it saw your neighbor being kidnapped by you have Nazis. to step up and stop it as christians yeah if you see somebody camp. being beat to death, what are you yeah. supposed to do as a believer? Mm -hmm. You know, we are supposed to step in and and uh, defend the weak. Scripture repeatedly talks about defending the weak. I've I've been seeing something throughout Scripture. We're often called to help the poor, and that does mean materially poor, but it also means spiritually poor, emotionally poor. There's a number of different types of poor in Scripture. It's usually referring specifically to financial, but but the right. poor is talked about. There's the poor in spirit. There's the poor. We are supposed to help somebody when they are in a poor position. And in the same thing we're talking about, here's, here's something. There's a correlation between the people who don't help the poor that claim to be Christians, who are doing nothing for the poor, not valuing the poor, and devaluing the poor. They say they're pro-life, but the life of a homeless person isn't that valuable. Mm -hmm. And they, they might say it with their words that they're valuable, but they never actually help the homeless. They never help, actually help people in need that are alive and born and have been given the chance to life. Um, those same people typically are the ones who aren't doing anything about the pro-life issue as well. They're not rising up to support pregnancy crisis centers, to support mothers, mm -hmm. to ensure that the baby's taken care of, to help family units, uh, mentor family units so that they don't break apart if they decide to mm -hmm. keep the baby, um, to adopt when a mother is just totally decided. You know, this is, we're actually supposed to respond with biblical justice to each one of these situations. We're not just, we ought to speak the truth out about it. But we're not supposed to just argue truth with people all day. Yeah. We're supposed to actually go and live the truth. We're supposed to be the ones adopting. We're supposed to be the ones uh, uh, helping the poor, helping them get back on their feet. We're supposed to be the ones helping mothers who are experiencing a crisis pregnancy. We are supposed to be the ones who are caring for the children that maybe that they've given up. This is our job as Christians. And I see a correlation between whether it's pro-life movement, whether it's helping the poor and, and eliminating poverty, uh, any of mm -hmm. these biblical justice situations where we're supposed to do something, oftentimes if somebody's just talking in one area, they're just talking in all of them. Mm -hmm. And we need to start being active in all of them and doing right. something. We're not all called to do the exact same thing. Right. Maybe you're not 
called to specifically adopt, but maybe you can go and be mm-hmm. a mentor at a pri- uh, pregnancy crisis center. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can work at a birth center. Right. Maybe you can uh, support uh, a low-income family that's gotten pregnant and they're considering abortion because they just don't have the funds to uh, keep the baby. Maybe you can mm-hmm. support that family financially. Whatever it is, we need to actually do the justice that God has commanded right. us to do. And it doesn't mean that because you're serving in one area, you can't serve in another area. Right, so absolutely. You might say, okay, this is my ministry. Yeah. Um, I can't get involved in your ministry. We like to break things up yeah. into little ministries. Like, yeah. no, this is just Good the point. Christian life. Just take things as they come. Don't yeah. s- turn someone away just because it doesn't fit into what you're doing currently. Yeah. So I'll always remember um, John in Pittsburgh. He's another sidewalk counselor. He runs a food bank every Wednesday. Awesome. But he still goes out to the abortion mill and tries yeah. to speak the truth in love to these women. Yeah. Like, it's not just one thing. Yeah. He's not like, oh, sorry, I'm feeding these I'm people. I'm too busy with help. this. Yeah. Or, oh, sorry, I go to the mill on Saturdays. That's no, I agree Christian with you. Duty, and and, duty and we day. may have a primary call. You might have a primary call, just like yeah. this gentleman. You know, his primary call is that he's running this food bank. Yeah. But at the same time, God has given us a lot of time in mm-hmm. life, and we can get involved in all these areas. And Mary makes a great point. These actually are all related. Let me put this together for you. Maybe you'll see it clearly, because we work with the homeless, we work with foster youth, and mm-hmm. we work with uh, pro-life and, and, and abortion, you know, the abortion industry. We work with um, advocating on uh, behalf of pro-life um, and doing things to support moms. So let me tell you how this all works together, and this is why God calls us to do justice in all of these areas biblically, supporting mm-hmm. supporting our neighbors, loving our neighbors, uh, caring for the weak and the vulnerable, helping the poor, helping the orphan. A mother decides not to abort. Awesome. But she does decide to give up for adoption, which is a immeasurably better decision than than killing the baby. But the the baby does go into foster care. Now, from foster care, they go through, they don't get adopted. They get into, um, you know, a lot of sin and a lot of different crimes and things. They age out. And they end up incarcerated, or they end up trafficked, or they end up a prostitute, or they end up any number of things. Mm -hmm. And then they grow up and they become an adult, and then maybe they're aborting their kids, or maybe their kids are going into foster care. And then they're the homeless person that you see. So that same baby that you... This is what it means to really be Mm pro-life. That same baby that maybe you did save, you helped a mom to not abort, you helped Mm -hmm. her to see, uh, now is the same person... 50 years later is a homeless person on the street corner that like you look down your nose at. Yeah. It's and it's the same human being. All these things connect. Uh, Yeah. I I can't tell you how often when we work with the homeless, you learn more and more about their story and their story is one of foster care and their parents giving them up in one way or another Mm -hmm. and their family abandoning them. Right. So these issues oftentimes are, and God knows this, that's why he tells us to do justice in the way yeah. that he does. They're all interwoven with one another. It's why the poor have value. It's why orphans have value. It's why babies in the womb have value. Because mm-hmm. that could be one person, all three of those. A yeah. baby in the womb, a foster child, a homeless adult, all one person. Right. And that's why we're called to help in all of these different areas and to do real justice and to be involved in all of them, even if you're called predominantly to one, to be involved and to recognize that they're all related and that we need to work together. If I'm pro-life and I'm going to help a mother throughout her pregnancy, Mm -hmm. I also need to help that baby once it exists, not just be like, great, it's born, Mm -hmm. see ya. You know, (laughs) I'm done. I did my job. I'm pro-life. I'm done. Like pro-life means supporting the life all the way through their life. Mm-hmm. The homeless person's life is just as valuable as it was when it was in the womb. It didn't mm-hmm. devalue as they got older. And it's not like, oh, now they're alive. Everything's good. Right. Everything's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. No, absolutely. You make great um, points. And another thing is, yes. when you go out to the mill, you'll notice that you're probably going to meet a lot of women who came out of sex trafficking, who were good orphans, point, yeah. who are homeless. 
Yeah. So you're kind of doing all those things in one. Yeah. When you step out in faith and say, and maybe they're in foster like care a, too. Exactly. Or I'm going to look like a crazy person and stand here yeah. and try to talk to people. This is all tied together, and it's why we right. need to meet people's needs at all stages of life. So when we're talking about pro life, yep, we're talking about in the womb, but we're also talking about out of the womb. We're talking about in foster care. We're talking about adopting. We're talking about homeless adults. We're talking about all of them. They all have value. All right, Exodus 21, 22 through 25. This is a passage that oftentimes maybe you'll interact with somebody who's pro-choice and, you know, they're like, aha, I got you. This is usually an aha, I got you passage that somebody pulls out to say that, oh, well, you know, even the Bible teaches that uh, a, a human being doesn't have value while it's in the womb. And it's because they actually misinterpret this passage. So we're going to read it together. Exodus chapter 21. Verse 22 through 25 says this, if people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to make a point. Some translations have historically said she has a miscarriage. In fact, if you look in the footnotes there, A, right beneath the passage, it says, or she has a miscarriage. So some have have uh, tried to say that that this is a miscarriage that's taking place. But the majority of... of um, of scrolls and of, of you know, theological um, uh, inspection as we've reviewed what the words are actually saying, it, it really actually indicates a premature birth, which does not immediately indicate that a death has taken place. It means that the baby came too soon, which could happen. So imagine two people are fighting, two guys are fighting, and the woman gets in between them to try and break up the fight, and she's eight months pregnant, and uh, she gets hit real hard, maybe knocked over, and she gives premature birth. The baby survives. That's a premature birth. This does mm-hmm. not indicate that death has taken place. And in fact, the next, the following words actually show that it's not indicating death, that this isn't a premature birth that results in death. It actually addresses death in the next verse, mm-hmm. but not in this one. So let's read it. Verse 22. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. Okay, so the point made here in verse 22 is that the death, or I'm sorry, the birth is premature, but there's no serious injury. Death is a serious injury. That's a serious injury to the other human being. Because elsewhere in scripture, we actually see, and we're going to see it here in verse 23, that when a mother and child die together that that's a double homicide that's true in the mm-hmm. united states even yeah. but but biblically that's true that the two are treated as as two separate beings and that two people have been killed and in fact that's even what this passage gets at in verse 23 it says this but if there is serious injury you are to take life for life eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand foot for foot burn for burn wound for wound bruise for bruise okay the point that's made here according to god's perfect law is that if a life is lost, then life is to be taken, meaning that any li- the mother or the baby or both, their lives are valuable, and therefore that the person who caused that, their life must be taken. Why? Because they're equal in value. So the payment for that debt is life for life. According, according to, we're talking about Old Testament, you know, God's command as far as this is the perfect law, like God has the right to put someone to death for sin, and specifically in this sin, he's saying when you've killed somebody as a result of this, that premature birth actually results in death, it re- then it's life for life. That person it deserves to die according to his law. That mm-hmm. obviously, and we're not going to get deep into the law tonight, obviously because of what Jesus has done, we're all guilty of, of, of death as far as sin is concerned and as far as God's law is concerned. And so through Jesus, we're given mercy and we're not put to death for our sins. However, the point is, the law indicates, and this is how we know how wonderful grace is, that when a life is lost, life is to be taken as a result of it, that that is actually the payment for it. So what that means is when this premature birth takes place, if serious injury does occur and life is lost during this premature birth, what's it mean? Life for life, meaning that that baby's value was equal to a human being's, and therefore it must be life for life, eye for eye, Mm -hmm. tooth for tooth. That's actually the point that this passage makes. So if you're ever discussing something with somebody, and they bring up this passage, and they're trying to prove from this passage, now you're equipped to kind of respond to that. If they're trying to prove that this means that, oh, you know, if they miscarry, you know, God don't even care, the person has to just pay a fine. No, no, no. If they give premature birth and the baby lives, they pay a fine. If they give premature birth and the baby dies, it was life for life. It was a serious offense. Yeah. 
So that's and and you've actually had people bring up this passage you yes, were mentioning. I have. When did that happen? How is that? Um, how did that come to be? Outside of the abortion mill, um, the doctor came out and wanted to discuss things with me. Whoa! So I to there talk you go. Hey, that's you know I would welcome that conversation. Yeah, it was it was a really good conversation. I think planted some seeds. Wow. I haven't been back to Pittsburgh in a while. I don't know what. Uh, yeah, what's become of that particular doctor? Yeah, is doing these well, and days. there are many doctors who used to and don't yeah. any longer because uh, yeah. one science, but two Christians come along and and teach biblically what 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 why it's wrong, right. and God convicts the heart and moves in a person's life, and they they repent and they start serving Jesus. This is true of uh, the very um, uh, the very woman from Roe versus Wade um, actually became pro life after that ruling. Yeah. Eventually, later on in life, yeah. because she was convicted by the Lord and realized how mm-hmm. uh, how precious life is at all mm-hmm. stages, and became pro life. It's it's interesting. There are a lot of people who, you know, really, and it's really when we're kind to them right. and we're gentle and we and we love them in the midst mm-hmm. of the mistake that they're making. A lot of people come to change their mind and come to come to repent and even come to know Jesus through this. Yeah. So this conversation, you have to remember, we're not going at it to go and fight with these pro-choice people just to fight and win. Mm-hmm. We're going to win souls. We want this person to be saved, the baby mm-hmm. in the womb, and also the person themselves, the abortion doctor, the nurse, the, the mother, the father. Every, we want them saved because God wants them saved. Yeah, it's true. If we get that abortionist saved then he will stop performing abortions. Absolutely. I wouldn't think it, the place would shut down because there are other abortionists that yeah. perform there. Yeah. But... Well, and I think I think that's a great uh, segue into showing... I want to show everybody um, oh. a video of the um, an abortion um, doctor uh, actually talking about the procedure. Mm-hmm. He used to be a doctor, and essentially he repented, came to... Uh, came to know what the truth was and uh, stopped practicing and now advocates uh, on pro-life. Um, and so I want you guys to check this out and hear this. And I'm going to listen to it as well with you. And, uh, and then we'll kind of chat about what he says in this video, because this really gives us insight into what's happening during an actual abortion. This, is, this really sheds light on why it's evil, because it yeah. is truly actually an evil act. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgery. 1,200 abortions. abortions. Dilatation and evacuation, or DE. A DE is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. With babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. 
The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more. So that is a powerful you... look into what really takes place. And that was that was just that was just illustration. That mm -hmm. wasn't even actual video. The, you know, if you've never seen an abortion actually practiced, you can find those videos online to really see how graphic it is. If you're considering abortion, um, I think that it's important to really understand what's happening to your baby um, and, and what they're doing. That is an extremely violent procedure, mm -hmm. ripping apart each limb. Uh, and there are several different methods, but, yeah. but this is one that is, that is uh, executed. And, and he had done 1,200 abortions, this doctor had shared, um, yeah. and said one day that he realized that it just was wrong. He looked at this baby after he had done it and realized that that is someone's son or daughter that's a human being. And it was just like he was convicted and stopped. And he, he says he'll never, he'll never perform another abortion. It's just, it's just not yeah. what he does. And so I think it's important, you know, as we no matter where you are on the spectrum, that you understand what an abortion actually is because it's really kind of dolled up and, and presented as like, not a big deal, but this is a human body that's being ripped apart uh, at all stages. It does look different at different stages, but um, at all stages, it's a human body that's just being mutilated. Um, and and it's, it's evil. The practice itself is evil. It's an evil thing um, that we've got to stop from happening. Um, and so I want to take a look as we start to wind down, because I know uh, it's almost, it's getting a little late, but we're going to, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, something I wanted to show everybody uh, is why abortions occur. And this is important to be informed because you often hear that rape and incest are like the, that gets brought up in almost every conversation about yeah. it. And those okay. situations matter, and we actually are going to address that as one of the final things that we address uh, before we end the stream tonight. But the truth is, statistically, that is less than half a percent. And you can see it right there. Why do abortions occur? This is according to the uh, uh, Gumaker Institute, um, and they, along with the CDC, provide uh, 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 different statistics. One thing that is uh, uh, the reason why the Institute is even more accurate than the CDC is because um, not all abortions are uh, actually reported, and some states right. actually have laws that prevent them from reporting to the CDC. And then you have so to the CDC doesn't have the full number, take typically. Take into account the morning after pill, which is a form of abortion right, that right. can just be bought at CVS Right, pharmacy. right. That one's just, right, right. But it's still ending so. a human life that has begun at conception. Um, and so less than half of a percent are actually uh, a victim of rape. And then you see uh, health problems, physical health, uh, would interfere with education or career, not mature enough to raise a child, don't want to be a single mother. Now we start to get into the high percentage reasons, which are done having children, can't afford a baby, not ready for a child. So the done having children, I believe the biblical response is that they're like arrows in a quiver and God mm -hmm. actually is going to bless you and provide for you, even if yeah. it's more children than you had anticipated. God means for your good, for your whole family's good. 
with another baby. Uh, can't afford a baby. This is a big part where the church needs to rally around right. these mothers. And this is a lot of what pregnancy crisis centers do. Mm -hmm. Rally around the moms, support them financially, support them with mm -hmm. baby care products, support them with mentorship, help them even after the baby's born right. so that they have the tools necessary to be a, a parent. Um, the churches need to rally around young mothers. Even if they're out of wedlock, we got to not be judgmental, but be compassionate and love the mother and the baby. Uh, and then 25%, so a quarter of all these is just not ready for a child. Just essentially just the idea of, well, I'm just, I just don't, I don't even have one of those reasons. It's just, I just am not ready for a child. I want to continue mm -hmm. to live life the way that I'm living it right, right now. I don't think anyone's really ready for a child if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, like, even when you're planning on having a kid, yeah. it can be a little, a uh, little bit, uh, so. <laughs> a little bit it's exciting let me tell you i have two kids it's very exciting but that first one like it's a little nerve-wracking yeah <laughs> but I then you see that god like provides for you and cares for you and mm -hmm. helps you to be a parent and has your good planned by giving mm -hmm. you this baby he's not giving this baby to you as a curse mm -hmm. the baby's a blessing i think you just have to work through the initial shock and fear of yes. having a child yes and so the biblical response to that group, not ready for a child, the way we need to approach those individuals is that God has a wonderful plan for that person's life and mm -hmm. for the baby's life, and that the way they've been living, if God's given them a baby, he has a new life for them available in yeah. Christ and as a parent. He has a new wonderful life available for them, and actually it's better than the one that they think they're losing. Yeah. And that's important to understand that that's how God works. For those that love God and are called according to his purpose, he works together all things for their good. So we want to help people to know that God loves them so that they will come to love God as well. And then he works things out for their good in their life. Mm. And then 6% is other. Now, state of Florida, I thought this was also interesting because that's the state that I reside in. No matter where you're watching uh, from, we're in Florida. And uh, what they say um, is that 0.001%. Uh, the pregnancy resulted from an incestuous relationship. 0.85% um, uh, the woman was raped. And then we go on with health and psychological and so on and so forth. Uh, serious uh, fetal anomaly. Okay, and then we get into the higher percent. Six percent is one of the higher. The woman aborted for social or economic reasons, which really goes along with the higher percentages that we saw up here, the 19, 23, and 25 percent up there. Um, so more than half of abortions, it seems, as far as the big statistics were concerned, are a result of that. And 92 percent hit no reason on 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 their particular forms, which it's elective. They don't have to give a reason. So that's why you say 92 percent. But if you're looking at, OK, of all the people who did say what they were doing, the highest percentage was the social and economic reason yeah. once again. And so that's important to understand that when we hear the rape and incest argument, when we hear these other arguments, those account for way, way, way less than half of abortions. Um, and in fact, the victim of rape one is less than half of a percent. Now, those situations matter. Mm -hmm. That's important to understand that those situations matter. And so I want to share um, much better than, you know, I think anything that we could share um, is someone who has been raped, um, who has gone through that, who has had the option to abort, who has been pressured to abort and decided not to. And so I want to share with you guys this uh, story from a woman who did become pregnant from rape. Her name's Jennifer, and she shares this really powerful story um, that sheds light on how this baby that God gives to a person, uh, to a mother and to the father, because it's a gift to both of them, how when God gives this child, that that child, even in a horrific situation like rape, which is horrific, it's an act of violence, it's a sin, it's horrific, that God, even then, is not giving this baby as a curse, but as a blessing. And in fact, this woman makes the point that the baby is really what healed the trauma from that experience. Instead of adding trauma to trauma, being raped is a trauma and then having a baby killed and then the potential medical conditions and, and adverse effects of abortion and then psychological adverse effects and emotional adverse effects. Those are all additional traumas that a mother who, we're, who we need to support goes through, mm -hmm. whereas this mom makes the point. Yeah. That after being raped, that that baby actually brought the healing that she needed. And I would just like to add real quick. Yes, yeah, a lot do. of times abusers will use abortion to hide what they're doing. Yes. 
And that's been seen right quite traffickers uh, oftentimes yes yes traffickers or or people who are hurting women are using abortion so it's a tool so of an aggressor in addition yeah it's a tool that they use and that should say something to us all right so this is this is Jennifer's story um, and we'll get it lined up here here we go what was my life like before the assault I think that things were pretty much pretty much status quo. You would consider us a, an average family. We had four kids and felt like I was kind of at the top of my game as an interpreter. I was taking on taking on more work and, and traveling. I had interpreted a few cruises, which was really cool, I thought. In uh, January of 2014, I uh, took a two-week two week assignment out of town. And the last day that I was there, I finished up my job and I went back to the hotel and uh, it was it was snowy. I made it to my room and you know opened the door and dropped all my stuff inside and turned around to close the door and there was a man in the doorway. He hit me in the head with a closed fist and things went kind of fuzzy and he dragged me back into the room and he raped me. I broke a couple of ribs and some fingers trying to fight until uh, I recognized that fighting was making it worse and disappeared somewhere inside myself. I uh, woke up hearing someone scream. I was in a stairwell outside of the hotel. I was wearing a broken bra and that's it. And it was below freezing temperatures, which actually probably saved my life because I had a brain bleed. Life after the assault was very challenging. I did not bounce back quickly. I was not able to resume normal life the way it had been. Five weeks after the rape, I was scheduled to interpret on a cruise. Day two, I'm, I'm sick, dysentery. I wasn't getting better. The one head doctor, she said, was there a chance you could be pregnant? And I just say, okay, look, <laughs> this is probably not, I, I'm almost sure I'm not, but um, I, I was raped, you know, last month and I, you should probably just go ahead and test me. She gives me the pregnancy test and there was a second line and I just, I just stare at it. We made a stop in uh, Cartagena, Colombia and I was taken to this, uh, looked like a little garage, this little hospital and I had a translator with me who I did not need because as soon as they put that ultrasound in, there was a little, little pee. And I've, I've, I've seen those little peas before. And that little pea was my son. And I smiled. I smiled at him. I feel like the world would be telling me, you're pregnant from something horrible. You should be angry and disgusted. And I felt this rush of fierce protectiveness over this baby. And I remember just putting my hands on my stomach and saying, like, I have to, I have to tell my husband, I have to tell my husband. And I said, I'm, I'm pregnant. And there was just a, a hair of a pause, just a split second. And he said, okay. I said, okay. <laughs> what do you mean? Okay. How is this okay? Like I, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, my parents are going to freak. What are your parents going to say? What do we tell the kids? Like I, I, my mind is going just all over the place. I'm like, how are you calm? And he said, he said, honey, this is something beautiful. He said, this is a gift. He said, this is something wonderful that's come out of something so painful for us. We love babies. And I said, yeah, we love babies. And he said, this is going to be awesome. I said, okay. He said, we can do this. We can do this, Jay. We can do this. I said, yeah, we can do this. My story is not one about choice. I'm not telling my story to say, look, this is the choice that I made. I'm talking to emphasize the humanity of my son. He's a reminder that God is still on the throne and that good still wins out over evil. In the grand scheme of things, when you look back and you think of the things that you'd like to take out of your life, I. 
I couldn't ever take back what happened to me because it would mean not having him. And he's worth it. That's a powerful story. I think it's with stories like Jennifer's that <clears throat> we really can understand. And she says that like she saw through this that God was still on the throne and that that he really was a blessing, that little boy. Mm -hmm. And the husband in this story, guys, fathers, you have got to support the mother of your children. Look at how that father stepped up in that story and said that that baby was a gift. Even though his wife had been violently raped, broken ribs, brain bleed, left in a, a stairwell in freezing temperatures, naked. You're talking about a truly horrific experience came upon his wife. And instead of responding with like, oh, that's not my baby. Or I'm not taking responsibility for that baby. That man rose up and said, hey, we love babies. We're going to take care. This is our baby. We need to see more support from the dads to the moms. We need to see the family coming together. Dads who might be watching this, please do not pressure the mother of your child to kill that child. God has given you a gift as well and given you an opportunity as a man to raise that child to have a good life. If God has given you that child, it means that he has entrusted that child to you. It means that you are capable of raising that child, both of you together, mother and father, capable of raising that child to have a wonderful life. He has entrusted that life to you. And I encourage you, dads, fellow men out there, please do not encourage the mother of your children to abort her baby. Support her. You are the first support beam. You are the first support beam, earthly speaking, because you were there, you were in the act, you were the one who helped bring that baby to be. And even in this situation where it was a result of a violent rape, this father stepped up and became a father to that child, even though the child wasn't biologically his. He adopted and loved that child. This is the kind of response that we have to have to this situation. It's love. What helped that mom? That God loved her, that God was giving her a gift, that her husband was loving and supporting her. Fathers, we've got to love and support the mothers of our children. Whether it's a rape, whether it's our child, whatever it is, we've got to love and support them. Church, we've got to love and support the mothers of God's children. We've got to rise up. God is a father to the fatherless. And so if we are representatives of God, we must go and be fathers and mothers to those who are fatherless and motherless. We have to love where children have been unloved at all stages in the womb born and when they come when when they when they come of age and become an adult we have to keep loving them that's what god has called us to do there is no point in time where a human life becomes unvaluable it's always valued we always love people we always want to bring the truth we want to help them know that god loves them through our love and so her story is really powerful mm -hmm. because it really sheds light on how how abortion is not this only option mm -hmm. that a person has, even in the most violent of situations. Right. We do not have to respond to mm -hmm. violence with violence. Exactly. And another thing, we do not have to give the capital punishment. See, we do not have mm -hmm. to, to give the death penalty to the child as a result right. of the crime of the father. Why are we punishing children for the crimes mm -hmm. of their fathers? It just doesn't make sense. If the father... If the, if the father has raped and done something evil, surely he, sh he should face the music uh, as far as our justice system is concerned. But why are we dishing out the capital punishment on the child? Mm -hmm. It's so dehumanizing to people who've been conceived in rape. Yes. That, that they're, they're not valuable. Less valuable. Yeah, I agree. So as we wrap this up, I want to make a couple of points to you guys as we close. We're going to talk about what the answers to abortion are. And, and, and also, um, I want you to go and, and research more about mm -hmm. this. I want you to take a look at um, the fact that the U.S. Department of Health 
is finally, praise God, finally defining life as beginning at conception. And the reason why the U.S. Department of Health is doing that now is because, and their strategic plan for 2018 to 2022, is because science has repeatedly proven mm -hmm. that at conception, this is the science side of things, yeah. at conception, a baby has a completely separate DNA strand from the mother and father. Mm -hmm. And it, it immediately is a separate life. And I want to remind everybody, a lot of times... The same culture who celebrates pro-choice is the same culture that celebrates we found bacterium on a distant planet. Yeah. So. And we celebrate bacteria as life. And yet this, this cell, which is far more valuable than bacteria, this, this human being that has its own DNA is also life. If that's precious to people, certainly this life is far more precious completely unique DNA strand. And then also science has shown us that the heart starts beating on the 22nd day in the womb. We have a heartbeat. Yeah. Mothers who are watching, maybe you're in your second, your third trimester. Maybe you're in your first. I want you to know that that baby, one, loves you, needs your love, is a life has a heart, has DNA, has potential, has purpose, just like you. And God has entrusted that child to you. Fathers, God has entrusted that child to you. Support the mother of your children. And so here's, here's the Christian answer to abortion. Here's how we're supposed to respond. Number one, Scripture actually says that someone who hates their brother does not even know God. And that murder is like the ultimate act of hating your brother, hating your neighbor. Yep. We cannot profess to be a believer and be pro-choice. You cannot profess to be a Christian and kill babies. You cannot profess to follow Christ and support, condone, and ensure the continuation of the slaughter of human children whom Christ has created. You are directly in opposition to Christ. Why? Because Scripture says that it's God knitting that baby together. So who are you fighting when you rip it apart? If you have been pro-choice as a believer, you must repent. You must turn to God away from your sins. Let go of of being worried about what man thinks of you, let go of being worried about what your fellow students think of you, what your family thinks of you, what your political class thinks of you, whatever it is, let that go. What matters is what God thinks of you, what God thinks of what you're doing. He loves that baby. He has foreordained for that baby to exist. And to kill that baby is an act against not only the baby, but God. And now listen, if you've been supportive of pro-choice, God, God still loves you. But you must come to repentance. Repentance means a change in mind. And then you demonstrate your repentance mm -hmm. by your deeds. And the deeds that you must come to do are these. And Mary and I are going to share them with you, and then we'll be done for tonight. Mm -hmm. We've got to support families. Yes. First and foremost, the church has to rally around families. We've got to support the institution of marriage. We've got to encourage people to be marriage, married, not in a judgmental spirit like, you need to be married, you sinner. It's right. not that. It's, it's I love keep you. keep the family together, you know? I want to see you succeed in life. Yeah. I want to see you have the best life possible. I know that marriage, if you're, if you're wanting to have sex, marriage is the best life possible possible that God has. God has mm -hmm. created it. Sex is pleasurable, but it is created for procreation. It's given as a, the method of creating more life. So if you want to have sex and enjoy its pleasures and create life through it, because that is its first purpose, we must be married, God says. And the reason being is not to harm us, but it's to 
to do good in our life. God will bless you in ways that you cannot even imagine when you become married as you trust God in that area. So marriage, and then churches, we've got to support marriages and help marriages not to fall apart. Mm -hmm. Divorce is huge in the Christian church and in this country. We have got to support families and help them not to divorce. We've got to help men get out of pornography addiction, which as you know, if you've watched this channel, is something that I have wrestled with in my life and have found the, the, the pathway to freedom and shared it in a previous podcast. We've got to help them with sexual temptation. We've got to help them with how they mistreat their wives, help them to treat their wives properly. Wives, women, you've got to help other wives and support them, help them to be respectful to their husbands, help them to support their husbands. We've got to help one another make the right decisions in our marriages, and we've got to do it as the church. We've got to support families. We've got to help families not feel so pressured economically that they've got to give their children up into the foster care system. So keeping the family together is number one. Number two, Mm. adoption. Adoption and fostering. If a family cannot help but have their children taken from them for a period of time, typically the way that child services work is a family will still have opportunities to get the child back unless there was a truly heinous crime that's been committed. They'll typically have parental rights for quite a while. The goal here is to foster the children. And even through that foster relationship, the best foster parents I know typically what they do is they also interact with the bio family and try and help the bio family as well. So mm-hmm. that they can get their child back. Because ultimately, that's going to be healing to the foster child yeah. and the parents. Absolutely. Because there is going to be a sense of abandonment no matter Absolutely. what. Absolutely. Even if adoption is what needs to happen. Yeah. And so, so, and then if, if the parental rights are terminated, that we make ourselves ready and available to adopt. This is a photo that I really love that I've shared a few times on social media, you know, when yeah. talking about this topic. Um, and... This is so beautiful because this really needs to be the response to abortion. Mm. We're not to go out and be trying to hurt people uh, with our words or being aggressive. The right thing to do is to be ready to do whatever's necessary. If a mom is totally just, she is just set on giving up that baby, then we need to be at the abortion mills, at the Planned Parenthoods, making ourselves ready and available. We need to be connected with pregnancy mm-hmm. crisis centers and ready to adopt and care for these children. Yep. Notice their signs. God loves you. That's the approach we need to have towards the moms and the dads and the abortion doctors and the nurses. God loves you and your baby. And then we make ourselves ready to do justice. We will adopt your baby. And also... Um, one of the last things uh, that we can do is support crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, and there are other things to do, but these are mm-hmm. three big ones. Supporting a crisis pregnancy center financially, um, because oftentimes what these centers do is they help the moms who are considering uh, terminating the pregnancy. And so they help the mom. They help her to keep the baby. They help her to uh, ed- have education in order to be able to parent effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, they provide material relief as well. Uh, oftentimes they can help with bills. They can help with child care products. They can help with a number of different things. Um, and so we want to get involved. We can become mentors. We can be financial supporters. We can be a number of things. So you see that the body right. of Christ can get involved in action in many different mm-hmm. ways. Uh, and also, just like what you're doing, getting involved in the actual um, uh, birth process and right. being there to support women throughout their pregnancies, mm-hmm. uh, being a midwife, uh, being um, uh, a, a doula, um, you know, helping out at these types of centers. You know, the right. point is that we support not just in word, but in action as well. And we'll share this. This is the last verse for the evening. I think that this is an important important one to end on. James 1.27, religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless is, is, is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Orphans are children who their parents have given up on them, and I believe that orphan includes in the womb. If a child's been orphaned in the womb, then we need to rise up as the church. Mm -hmm. Real religion, real following. See, we're not even pro-life. That's an identity that we take on to help people understand that we support keeping the life. What we ultimately are is believers in Jesus. And as believers in Jesus, our true religion, our true practice of religion is to look after orphans. Yeah. Whether they're in the womb 
or out of it. If somebody's been abandoned by their parents, we care about them. If somebody's we've been adopted into God's kingdom. Exactly. And that is just each one of us through Christ have been adopted yeah. into sonship. So the answer to this crisis is to support the family. And if the family just cannot keep the baby or chooses not to, that we rise up as the church and we become the family of those children. And notice it says orphans and widows. Widows um, were women who their husband has passed away, but another classification is a woman who does not have any family support. She's right. single and alone. So the church is supposed to support. This is a this is a ancient practice in God's word to care for the fatherless, the orphan, and the widow. And that's real pro-life. Why? Because it's real Christianity. Yeah. This is about just being a real Christian. Absolutely. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this conversation tonight. I hope that those of you who might be professing to be a Christian and have been pro-choice, that you might come to repentance and, and see the truth here, that it's God that we're fighting. It's not a political ideology. It's not any of that, that it's, it's, it's God. God loves that baby and is knitting that baby together, and we do not want to be in opposition to him. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are mothers who are considering it, I want you to know that God loves you, that you have purpose, that God has a plan for you and your baby, and that he is going to take care of you if you put your trust in him. Those of you who might have been uh, or are in the abortion industry, I hope that you will reconsider, both on the spiritual and scientific basis, why this is a genocide of huge proportions and why we do not want to participate in this. We do not want to be part of, of, of the killing of babies. Um, and, and for those of you who are believers and are already pro-life, I hope that you have seen through this that we ought to be gentle and loving and kind so that we might lead people mm -hmm. to repentance, that we need to do more than just talk. Yep. We need to actually indeed support people who are in need because the, the highest reasons for abortion are socioeconomic. They are all having to do with something social or economical or, you know, material. Um, and so we need to rally mm -hmm. around and support people, not just in word, but in deed and in truth. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this talk tonight. Mary, I've really enjoyed having you on this evening. Yep, did, did you enjoy yourself? I did. We'll have you again. Okay. That'll be awesome. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and uh, also, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to share with you guys, there is a local uh, uh, crisis uh, pregnancy Center here in Daytona Beach, if you're in the Florida area, even if you're not, listen, they, these types of centers always need support from people all over. This is one that we like to support ourselves. And mm -hmm. I want you guys to go, um, the website link is in the description, but head over to uh, freepregtestdaytona.com. The organization is Resources for Women. They support women who are experiencing a crisis uh, pregnancy. Um, they give them the tools that they need. They will even facilitate adoptions. Uh, they will help them if they keep the baby. Um, they do a lot of good. So you can give. They also list a number of ways that you can get involved. And maybe in your city, you have something similar to this that you can get involved in uh, and support. Uh, I want you to find out, you know, pray and seek God. What does he want you to do? But for those of you who don't really know and you want to do something right now, I encourage you, go to Resources for Women's website. The link is in the description. Click that Give Now link and give to them and support them uh, because they are doing a good work here in our city. Hey, we love you guys. i I'm so thankful that you tuned in to watch this. This is an important uh, topic. This is something that is not going away, but from us digging our heads into the sand, we must stand up and we must abolish this from taking place. We have to stop it from being in existence. We have to stop abortion. And the first way is that we start to love the moms. We care for people. We culturally help people. We teach them about Jesus. And then we also socially vote against it. And we make sure that these things are, are are made to be unlawful because it truly is uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 a human being that is being harmed and murdered and killed. And so we want to be active in both ways and be gentle and kind and loving uh, throughout our activism. So, Mary, thank you very much. You're welcome. You, you are a you. wonderful guest. We'll, we'll be uh, <laughs> thrilled to have you on again. Those of you who are uh, in the comments, thank you very much for uh, participating in this conversation, uh, all of those who had tuned in. And also, um, will you please uh, like this video, um, 
comment below with any anything that you want to talk about on this topic or any questions that you would like answered in a future podcast. And also, uh, please share this video with your friends. Subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed and uh, click the little bell icon and you will actually get a notification. Also, if you'd like to support this channel, you can head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash rich tidwell. You can give like a dollar a month or two dollars a month, whatever you want. And it just goes to supporting the channel. Also, big thanks to Russell for uh, Russell Holloway, who's been a guest on the show before, who actually uh, is allowing us to use uh, two of his mics here, these podcasting mics. So thank you, Russell. We appreciate you. Listen, love you guys. Thank you for watching. Brethren, I pray that God blesses you, that he would lead you to repentance where you need to repent, that he would lead you to life and to making choices that produce life, and that he would He would guide you in every decision that you make, that you would become more like Jesus as a result of this stream and as a result of God's word taking root in you and in your life. We love you guys. Have a great week. We will see you right here again, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the next He is Greater podcast next Saturday. Mary, thanks again. Have a great night. Say bye yeah. to the viewers. Goodbye. See you guys. <laughs>